It's fight night at the White House. President Trump, Joe Biden going mano y mano. Plus, Mark Zuckerberg's week just got worse, and Republicans struggle to pass their big omnibus spending bill. We'll go through all of this stuff and an exclusive interview with Speaker of the House Paul Ryan. I'm Ben Shapiro. This is The Ben Shapiro Show. So indeed, yesterday we were in Washington, D.C. We had a great time. We got to go to see all of the sites from the inside. We got to meet with Speaker Ryan. We'll have our exclusive interview with Speaker Ryan a little bit later in the program, uh, so which I'm very much looking forward to showing you because it was, a, it was a lot of fun. We didn't talk a lot actually about kind of day-to-day -day politics. We talked more about broad things that he should be doing in Congress to change the nature of government, which I think is a little more important because we talk day-to-day -day politics on the show. We'll get to all of that, plus the greatest story of the last two years, maybe. Maybe it's pretty great. We'll get to that in just one second. First, I want to say thank you to our sponsors over at My Patriot Supply. So right now, does it feel like the world may be about to end? Well, it might be. You know, maybe there's a natural disaster coming your way, or maybe there's going to be a North Korean sneak nuclear attack. Probably the natural disaster is more likely. In either case, you need to protect your family with an emergency food supply, and you can do it with the, the experts at My Patriot Supply. This is the week to build a foundation of safety. Today, you can get this Ben Shapiro special offer from My Patriot Supply. Buy one four-week emergency food kit for only $198, and you get one free. So buy, again, a four-week emergency food kit for $198, and you get one free. These kits normally sell for $217, so you're getting it for about $20 off. You purchase one right now at the low sale price of $198, and My Patriot Supply sends you an additional four-week food kit for free. So you're getting it for less than half the price, essentially. Call 888-803-1413 or order online at preparewithben.com. That's 888-803-1413 or preparewithben.com. The kits include breakfast, lunches, dinners, packed in a rugged, slimline tote. This ensures that your family is safe. You buy it, you leave it in the closet. You don't have to worry about it. It lasts in storage for 25 years. If something goes wrong, you're the only one who's prepared. Go to preparewithben.com. There is a purchase limit of two per order. Supplies are limited. Do it now. I'm, we're not going to be talking about this amazing offer anytime again in the near future. So check it out right now. Preparewithben.com. And again, get that kit for, for $198 bucks and an additional four-week food kit for free when you go to preparewithben.com. That's preparewithben.com. Make sure that you and your family are indeed prepared in case of disaster. Okay, so there is a lot of actual news to talk about, but the most important news, the thing that we all care about the most, is that there's going to be a fight, 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 fight between Joe Biden, the vice, former vice president of the United States, in this corner, and in this corner, Donald J. McFace Trump. It's going to be so great. Okay, so here's how it all started. So Biden has been trying to outman Trump. Okay, Biden understands something a lot of other politicians don't. You can't actually just fly over the top of Trump. You can't say, I'll play the high road and he'll play the low road. And we'll be in Scotland before you. You can't, can't actually do that with Trump. You actually have to get down in the mud with him. So Biden gets this. And so Biden speaks Trump's language. So they're sort of weird reverse mirror images of one another. It's like bizarro Trump is Joe Biden and bizarro Biden is, is Trump. So it's, it's very weird. So it starts off, clip 13, Joe Biden yesterday saying that he would have beaten up Trump in high school, which is a real weird thing to say. When a guy who ended up becoming a national leader said, I can grab a woman anywhere and she likes it. And then said, I, I made a mistake. They asked me, would I like to debate this gentleman? And I said, no. I said, if we're in high school, I'd take you behind the gym and beat the hell out of him. <laughs> if we were in high school, I'd beat the hell out of the president of the United States. Says, and then he, he continues this way. Locker was my whole life. A pretty damn good athlete. Any guy who talked that way was usually the fattest, ugliest SOB in the room. <laughs> So Trump is a fat, ugly SOB, and the only people who talk like that are the biggest, fattest, ugliest SOBs in the room. Funny, because you're talking like that now, right now, Senator Biden, and so, and then, or Vice President Biden, and then Trump fires back. So here's what Trump tweets. It's just, come on, this is great stuff. This is great stuff. Come on, how can you not love this? Okay, here's what he tweets back this morning. Uh, it's, so, it's so phenomenal. Crazy Joe Biden is trying to act like a tough guy. Actually, he is weak, both mentally and physically, and yet he threatens me for the second time with physical assault. He doesn't know me, but he would go down fast and hard, crying all the way. Don't threaten people, Joe. <laughs> it's the best. Okay, so Joe Biden had threatened to beat Trump up actually several months ago, saying that if they got in a fight, he would take down Trump. And now you got the president of the United States. Imagine this. There's a very funny Twitter account that takes all of Trump's tweets and puts them in the format of presidential statements. Imagine the presidential statement, like you wake up from a coma, and this is what you see. And you're like, oh, J J Donald Trump's in a fight with, J wait, Donald Trump's the president and he tweeted that? So yeah, that's the thing that happened. And I love it. I gotta say, I love it, right? He is weak, both mentally and physically. And yet he threatens me for the second time with physical assault. He doesn't know me. He would go down fast and hard crying all the way. Love it. J fast and hard crying all the way. 
Yes. And actually, so, so they're now booking a fight and the fight will be booked. And we actually have some training footage of, of what's been going on in the, in the run up to this massive fight. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I do a million of these a day. So just give me five. Hey, <laughs> oh man, that's hilarious. It's Joe Biden pumping iron. He's on the phone, he's got like a dumbbell and he's pumping iron. Then it's Trump from WWE just knocking people over. Oh, it's so great. So I have volunteered. If they do this fight, first of all, there's no way this is bad for America, okay? America's already toast when it comes to our vulgar political culture. We're done, okay? Donald Trump is the president, Hillary ran, Joe Biden is an idiot. He's gonna run, he, he may win in 2020. Oh my goodness. <sighs> okay, so I volunteer, okay? I volunteer, I won't, I won't get paid for it. I, I'm, I wanna be the announcer on this, okay? I wanna be the announcer on this. I, I tweeted out some of the things that I thought would happen. Some people tweeted back some lines, so not all of these lines that you're about to hear are my own, but. I do want to announce this fight. I think it would sound something like this. Something like this. Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the ruckus in the hospice, the brawl on Geritol, the melee over the jello tray, the headlock on Matlock. This is a 12-round bout between 74-year-old Donald J. Trump and 78-year-old Joseph R. Biden, fought at the catch weight of 245 pounds. Biden has had to drink four insurers per day to make weight. Bernie Sanders was invited, but there was not enough pudding in the world to ensure that he reached catch weight. Let's get ready to stumble. And here we go. Trump comes out jabbing insulin. Biden hits him with a hard left and Trump is spitting dentures. Trump responds with a clap to Biden's cheek. He clapped on and Biden clapped off. Biden's gonna feel that in his walk-in bath tomorrow. Trump's out there looking a little bit fuzzy out there, as fuzzy as a tennis ball is on his walker. And now they're both down on the mat. They're both down on the mat. They are both napping. Oh, and they're back up again, circling each other warily, looking for an opening, and boom! Trump just pulled the old reverse mortgage on Biden, and Biden is down! Biden is down! He's fallen, and he can't get up! He's punching his life alert button! Oh my goodness, both of them now being carted off in wheelchairs, but to be honest, both of them were carted in in wheelchairs, but still. So it would sound something like that. I mean, wouldn't that be great? Come on, come on, this would be great for American politics. There's no way this goes wrong. Are things incredibly stupid? Yes. Things are incredibly stupid, ladies and gentlemen. Things are incredibly stupid. Well, in other stupid news, it's time for Congress to pass another crappy omnibus package. So, there's a big omnibus package coming out. Congress is no longer capable of actually just passing appropriations bills. Here is the problem. You know, the, the Congress, the House of Representatives, will go forward with appropriations bills. They will pass through the normal appropriations process. The way that you're supposed to do budgets is you are supposed to fund individual departments, and then you're supposed to send a bill to the Senate, and the Senate is supposed to fund that individual department, and then the president signs it. Instead, what has happened, because Mitch McConnell does not have a governing majority in the, in the Senate, he has 51 votes, but they're all fractious. Instead, they just slap everything together in a crap sandwich of a bill that's 2,232 2, pages long. And then they give people 48 hours to read it and say, we well, got to vote. And they put a bunch of good stuff in there and they put a bunch of bad stuff in there. So some of the good stuff that is in there, okay, there is, there is some funding for the wall, like a very, very, very little bit of funding for the wall. There, there, you know, there's some things that are being pushed by sort of the left wing of the Republican Party. There's uh, increased funding for the Child Care Access Means Parents in Schools program, uh, which means that parents will have access to on-campus child care and this sort of thing if this is, if this is your, your stuff, if this is the stuff that you like. Uh, the, the funding is there for the military. Uh, this is what Speaker of the House Paul Ryan has focused on. He says that this is the biggest increase in the military in 15 years, the biggest pay raise for our men and women in uniform in eight years. We need to rebuild our military. So there is an increase in funding for the military. It does a little bit of funding for the wall. It has a little bit of funding for fighting opioid addiction. Uh, and, it, and it does not, in fact, enshrine DACA. So this is one of the things Democrats are saying. Democrats are saying they're going to vote against the bill because the bill doesn't provide full funding for the DACA program to allow people in the country legally to remain here working legally. But that's because Democrats don't actually want to deal on DACA. As I've been saying for literally years at this point on the show, Democrats want to use illegal immigration as a, a hot button issue when it comes to the elections, but they don't actually want to solve the problems for illegal immigrants. In fact, Paul Ryan went to the Democrats and he offered them a really sweetheart deal. He offered them three years of funding for the wall, so $25 billion over three years for the wall, and in exchange, three years of additional funding for the DACA program. Right? We'd push off DACA, nobody would get deported. Democrats turned that down flat. 
Okay, and they waited until the last minute to do it, and now they'll vote against the bill saying that Republicans didn't give enough. So Democrats were offered what they wanted on DACA and uh, would have brought them past the next presidential election, actually, and they turned it down anyway because they just want to run on this issue. Here are some of the conservative concerns with all of this. The Freedom Caucus, the House Freedom Caucus, uh, has officially opposed the omnibus. I've spoken to a lot of members of the House Freedom Caucus, spoken to several senators who have opposed the bill. Senator Mike Lee in Utah is opposed to the bill. He says it's, it's just unconscionable that Mitch McConnell is forcing through another one of these omnibus packages that is essentially a giant crap sandwich that nobody is going to read. Here's what the Freedom Caucus says in their statement. They say the policy proposals outlined in this $1.3 trillion spending bill are not consistent with what we told the American people we would do when they sent us to Washington. Many of the policies in the bill are in fact the opposite of what we promised. In fact, one of the members of the Freedom Caucus was saying to me yesterday that he was tempted to call this the Broken Promises Act of 2018. This bill barely provides for border security, yet continues to allow federal dollars to flow to sanctuary cities. It also includes the fixed NICS proposal without including reciprocity for Americans with concealed carry licenses, something congressional leadership promised would not happen. It continues to fully fund grants that go to Planned Parenthood. It makes no changes to reduce Obamacare's burdensome regulations on America's families. It doesn't get rid of Obamacare regulations. And on top of the massive price tag, Leadership is forcing a vote on this 2,232-page bill in under 36 hours. It's an insult to America's taxpayers, as well as many rank-and-file representatives who had no say in the omnibus negotiations. So the House Freedom Caucus coming out extraordinarily strong against all of this. Now, will it probably pass anyway? Sure, because a majority of Republicans will vote for it, and then there will be a bunch of Democrats who vote for it because it's a big omnibus package. But there's a procedural hurdle they have to jump today. Uh, it'll be interesting to see whether they are able to do so, because in order for that procedural hurdle to be jumped, every Democrat's going to jump against it. It's possible that this, this bill gets voted down and is brought back for further changes. So one of the things that the Freedom Caucus talks about there is the, NI, the fixed NICS bill. So what exactly is that? Jacob Sullum over at Reason Magazine says this. He says, legislation aimed at improving background checks for gun buyers may be included in a must-pass spending bill Congress is expected to approve tomorrow or Friday. The bill would encourage data sharing with the FBI's National Instant Criminal Background Check System. It's faced a bunch of resistance for a measure that has broad support. Some of the resistance is tactical because Democrats want broader gun control. But there are also substantive concerns about the bill raised by supporters of gun rights who worry that it will help block firearm sales to people who pose no threat to others. I'll explain why in just a second. First, I want to say thank you to our sponsors over at Lending Club. So listen, we all need a helping hand sometime, whether it's unexpected repairs or medical expenses or credit card debt. Sometimes you just need a little bit of money on relatively short notice. Well, Lending Club gives you access to low rates on loans of up to $40,000 for almost any purpose, right? You need a home loan because you need, to you need to make all those home improvements. This is better than going to the bank. It offers lower rates than high interest credit cards. And you go to LendingClub.com, here's how it works, and you enter how much money you need, and you can see if you are approved in minutes. And then you pick the offer that is right for you, and the money can be in your account in just a matter of days. It is that simple. They've been working for over 10 years to help millions of people with over $31 billion in loans. Go to LendingClub.com slash Ben. You can check your rate for free. LendingClub.com slash Ben. It will not impact your credit score as well. as LendingClub.com slash Ben. LendingClub.com slash Ben. All the loans via Lending Club. These are top-notch products, and you get to choose, right? It's all about uh, the choice is up to you. LendingClub.com slash Ben. All loans made by WebBank, member FDIC, equal housing lender. Check it out. Uh, again, if you're looking for just that, that swing loan that you need for right now, this is a fantastic way to do it. LendingClub.com slash Ben. Get your loans through Lending Club. Again, uh, LendingClub.com slash Ben lets them know that we sent you as well, and you can check your credit for free. Uh, and uh, it doesn't impact your credit rating. You can check the rates that you receive for free. So what exactly is the problem with the fixed NICS program that is embedded in this bill? Well, Senator Cornyn from Texas introduced this last November in response to the Sutherland Springs shooting. Cornyn's bill aims to prevent the screw-ups that prevented the sharing of information with the National Instant Background Check System. Okay, they would also encourage sharing of local and state records. But, for example, Senator Lee has due process objections to the bill. He argues that the Department of Veterans Affairs wrongly identifies veterans as mental defectives, which disqualifies them from gun ownerships when they need help managing their benefits. Right? This was a serious problem with an executive order that Obama had tried to put out last year and that was revoked by President Trump. That executive order was an attempt to prohibit seniors who had other people do their finances from owning weapons. Well, this sort of does the same thing because the Department of Veterans Affairs will say that veterans have mental defective, uh, are mentally defective if they need help managing their benefits. Lee says about 168,000 veterans have lost their Second Amendment rights as a result of that particular policy. Lee favors an amendment requiring a judge to determine a person's a danger to himself or other. So nobody's against more transparency in the national instant background check system, but the question is what standard is going to be used to deny people a gun? 
uh, and that standard does have to be changed. Other conservative concerns with this bill, aside from the process, aside from the fact that these omnibus packages stink, that they are garbage. And again, I think this is less on Speaker Ryan because the House has consistently passed appropriations bills, and it's more on, on Senator McConnell. Now, listen, it's up to Ryan to, to please McConnell, right? He could just tell McConnell, listen, Bob, you're on your own. Get it right. Do the appropriations process. Do what you need to do, right? You, you do this. But he's not. He's working with McConnell back channel. This is one of the great ten tensions that, that exists on the Hill. Right? I just was in Washington, D.C. yesterday. My speech at Georgetown was canceled by actual snowflakes, not like the students, by like actual snow. I spent some time talking with a bunch of congressional staffers and a bunch of Congress people, including members of the Freedom Caucus. And this is the difficulty, okay? People like me actually have a relatively easy job. My job is to get on the air every day and to talk to you about the things that are going on and to explain what I think is right and wrong about these bills and to analyze and to stump for better bills. When you're in Congress, there's also a tendency to try and get things done, right? The, the government needs to be funded. We need to, somehow, we need to somehow bridge the gap between what we want and what we can get. Well, sometimes that makes things pretty awkward because there are a lot of Republicans who are going to vote for an omnibus package, number one, because they want to maintain their seats, and it's better to have a Republican in that seat than a Democrat, and number two, because they're seriously concerned about things like military spending. So what's the easiest way to do this? The easiest way to do this is to slap together a crappy omnibus package, and then you say to your constituents, listen, I didn't like a lot of the stuff in there, but I liked some of the stuff in there, and I needed to vote for it because of that. This is why it's up to Mitch McConnell to do a better job of keeping his members in line. Now, what's amazing is that a lot of senators are afraid of Senate Majority Leader McConnell. A lot of senators are afraid that he is sort of in de facto control of the National Senatorial Committee for the Republicans, the, NR the NRSC, um, that he is willing to remove money from them or undercut them. And so they are willing to go along and get along with Senate Majority Leader McConnell. But the reality is that if they don't stand up at a certain point and say to McConnell, listen, we're not going to vote for these omnibus packages anymore. We're going to only vote for packages that we like, then you're never going to get anything better. The government is just going to continue to grow. So the Republican Study Committee stayed up all night last night to try and read through this egregious bill. And, uh, and some of the stuff that they found in there truly is, uh, truly is not great. So let's start going through it. So here's what they say. Okay, here's the statement from the, Republican, uh, from the Republican Study Committee. They say, some conservatives will be concerned that the bill would fund the federal government at a level that exceeds the BCA discretionary spending caps for fiscal year 2018 prior to the passage of the Bipartisan Budget Act of 2018. Particularly concerning is the increase in non-defense discretionary spending, which exceeds the cap by $63 billion and fiscal year spending by $60 billion. The boost in non-defense discretionary spending represents the largest single year increase in non-defense discretional spending since the BCA caps, this would be the, the sequestration caps, were created. Conservatives may believe this is a reflection of the fact that Democrats have been successful in handcuffing NDD spending to fully funding the national defense. Together, the omnibus's increase in defense and non-defense spending will increase the deficit by $143 billion. This goes to a point that I've been making for a long time. Republicans are in the business of cutting taxes. They're not actually in the business of cutting spending. Too many Republicans don't care about cutting spending. See, it's fiscally hard to cut spending. It is politically hard to cut spending. Right? You take a lot of crap for cutting spending. You never take crap for increasing spending. And this is one of the problems here, is that so many folks are focused on being popular and not enough focused on doing the right thing especially in an off-year election, right? In 2018, there's a, a fear that Republicans are going to lose the House, and then what do you have? Then you have Nancy Pelosi in charge of making these laws. So, listen, I have a lot of sympathy for Republican staffers and Republican House members trying to figure out what to do here. Go back to the drawing board. Give us something better. This bill is not up to the standards. And what's the point of you winning elections if you're not going to do anything with the power once you finally have the power? Right? It continues to fund things like local transit programs. It funds the D.C. Opera House. It has large spending increases in the Agriculture Appropriations Division, which is idiotic. It funds the National Endowments for the Arts and Humanities. It funds the Refugee and Entrance Assistant Programs. It funds the Social Security Block Grant Program. It doesn't change Obamacare in any significant way. It does not include Dodd-Frank rollback language. It doesn't include a provision prohibiting funding for administrative expenses of an Obamacare multi-state plan that provides coverage for abortion. It doesn't include a provision to prevent, to prevent federal funding for ICE enforcement to provide for abortions. The bill does not contain the Conscience Protection Act. The bill contains a Treasury forfeiture fund, no explicit provision, prohibition on the Gateway Tunnel funding. The, the bill doesn't include a provision to prohibit the EPA from implementing greenhouse gas regulations. In other words, it's a garbage program to fund the government so that people don't actually have to do anything. And now, again, is there some good stuff here? Yes, I mean, we do have to fund defense. Okay, Defense has been s just slashed tremendously by the number of, by, by, by the Obama era cuts. And that's really, you know, quite disastrous that, that Obama did that in the first place. We have to ramp up our defense spending again. But Republicans are in charge, and it's, Rep it's on Republicans' head what they, what they pass here. Go back to the drawing board, make some changes. I have a feeling you can get at least something better.
you can get at least something better because this is just not a thing, right? This is just not a, uh, this, is, this is not good enough for a Republican House to pass. Okay, meanwhile, meanwhile, Facebook uh, is finding itself in additional trouble. So Mark Zuckerberg has been on the hot seat for quite a while here, and he is continuing to be on the, on the hot seat, but not for good reason. Yeah, I think there are lots of good reasons for Mark Zuckerberg to be on the hot seat. I think as a conservative, the discrimination against conservative news outlets has been egregious over the past several months, and that's why you've seen traffic, dry, uh, traffic decline for every conservative website, you know, like all of them. Okay, but the reason that he's really getting flack is because the left has decided that Mark Zuckerberg is responsible for Hillary losing. So let's count all the people responsible for Hillary losing. According to the media, it's not Trump, right? Trump didn't win the election, he lost. The people responsible for Hillary losing are, in order, James Comey, the Russians, the conservative media, and social media, right? And so they finally got into the last on their list, social media, and they're trying to encourage everybody on social media to change the nature of their algorithms in order to prevent conservatives from disseminating information. So CNN is hot and bothered about Facebook having allowed companies to gather information from Facebook, okay? Which, as I've said, everyone does on Facebook. If you join Farmville on Facebook, you are go if you play Farmville, you are having your information drawn from Facebook. Every time you click on anything on the internet, somebody is gathering that information in order to drive an ad program to you. This is how people make money on the internet. Okay, but CNN grills Zuckerberg and they ask, can people trust Facebook? The answer is, of course people can't trust Facebook. They never could trust Facebook. And if you thought that, that Facebook was your friend and that Facebook wasn't attempting to market to you, how do you think they made their money? It's ridiculous. Facebook has asked us to share our data, to share our lives on this platform, and has wanted us to be transparent. And people don't feel like they've received that same amount of transparency. They're wondering what's happening to their data. Can they trust Facebook? Yeah, so one of the most important things that I think we need to do here is make sure that we tell everyone whose data was affected by one of these rogue apps, right? And, and we're going to do that. Uh, we're we're going to build a, a tool. Uh, where anyone can go and, and see if, if their data was a part of this. But so the 50 million people that were impacted, they will be able to tell if they were impacted by this. Uh, yeah, we're, and we're going to be even conservative on that. So, you know, we, we may not have all of the data in our system today. So anyone whose data might have been affected. Okay, this by is this. such nonsense. I mean, okay, want to know whose data was affected? Everyone's. Okay, on Facebook, because everyone is gathering information for it from you all the time on Facebook. It's how Facebook makes their money. Okay, that's, this is just silly talk. It's silly talk. And Zuckerberg pretending, oh, we'll be fully transparent. Oh, we'll finally reveal everything that we know. Oh, we're finally going to show you the inside workings of our... None of this is going to happen. None of this is going to happen. Zuckerberg's pandering, by the way, is really egregious. I mean, he even says that he would love to see regulations on Facebook. Okay, this is just nonsense. Here's Zuckerberg saying that he's not even sure that they shouldn't be regulated. Given the stakes here, why shouldn't Facebook be regulated? Um, I, I actually am not sure we shouldn't be regulated. What the hell? Okay, of course he's sure they shouldn't be regulated. Why do you think he's attempting to self-regulate right now? He doesn't want to be regulated because he's afraid it will cut into his bottom line. So what's he doing? He's doing what Democrats want so they don't regulate him. Okay, this is outside Democratic pressure in order to ensure that social media companies do what Democrats want. Okay, in a second, I'm going to give you the update on what Zuckerberg posted, because he posted this long, ridiculous letter uh, about, about what's been going on with the Cambridge Analytica situation. I'm going to read it to you in just a second and analyze it. But first, I want to say thank you to our, our sponsors over at Zeal. So March is National Sleep Awareness Month. I haven't been getting enough sleep, which is why over this weekend, I plan on using the Zeal app. Zeal is the leader in on-demand massage. They want you to know the best way to get the most restorative sleep without a new mattress or fancy equipment or sleeping pills is a sleep massage. Research shows it can help you sleep better and treat insomnia. All month long, Zeal's 10,000 world-class massage therapists are ready to help you sleep better with your very own on-demand sleep massage. Go to zeal.com or the Zeal app, Z-E-E-L, select the sleep massage, massage therapist's gender, time, location for your massage, and as little as an hour, you're going to get a five-star massage in your home. They bring the table, they bring the sheets, they bring the, the massage oils, they bring the scented can, like they bring everything. They make the spa happen in your house. You're not waiting around for a, for a date to come up on the calendar for the spa. You're not paying inordinate amounts of money. That's what Zeal is, it's great. I mean, I've, I've gotten it as a gift for many members of my family. Zeal is offering you 20 bucks off your first sleep massage with promo code Ben now through March 31st. Go to zeal.com, Z-E-E-L.com and use promo code Ben to schedule your sleep massage today. Again, that's zeal.com, promo, promo code Ben. Use that promo code Ben so that you get 20 bucks off your first sleep massage with, with Zeal. And again, all of their masseuses are just tremendous. They're all licensed. It's really terrific. Okay, so Mark Zuckerberg issues a letter yesterday about the Cambridge Analytica situation. And here's what he says, quote, I want to share an update on the Cambridge Analytica situation, including the steps we've already taken and our next steps to address this important issue. We have a responsibility to protect your data. And then he gives a timeline of events. 
It says, in 2007, we launched the Facebook platform with the vision that more apps should be social. Your calendar should be able to show your friends' birthdays, your maps should show where your friends live, and your address books should show their pictures. To do this, we enabled people to log into apps and share who their friends were and some information about them. In 2013, a Cambridge University researcher named Alexander Kogan created a personality quiz app. It was installed by about 300,000 people who shared their data as well as some of their friends' data. Given the way our platform worked at the time, this meant Kogan was able to access tens of millions of their friends' data. In 2014, to prevent abusive apps, we announced that we were changing the entire platform to dramatically limit the data apps could access. Most importantly, apps like Kogan's could no longer ask for data about a person's friends unless their friends had also authorized the app. Okay, so here's what I want to point out here. Okay, what happened in this timeline? He goes from 2007 to 2014. He just skips over everything else. What, hmm, what happened between 2008 and 2012? We're like, there's some things that happened. Like, I seem to remember in 2012, for example, the Obama administration using exactly the same strategy in order to gather data on people. Okay, but then he just skips right over that. It's just Cambridge Analytica that's, that's doing terrible, terrible things. Listen, do I think Cambridge Analytica may have been a little shady? Sure. Do I think they did anything dramatically different, as far as I'm aware, than, than the stuff that Obama was doing? Am I supposed to be angry that people gather data on Facebook? This is all nonsense. It's all nonsense. I mean, this is, this is all crazy. He says, in the next month, we'll show everyone a tool at the top of your news feed with the apps you've used and an easy way to revoke those apps' permission to your data. We already have a tool to do this in your privacy settings. Now we will put this tool at the top of your news feed to make sure everyone sees it. So I'm glad they've used the news feed to get rid of all the people you actually follow. And now they're going to insert a bunch of crap that they want you to know about. But they're not going to allow you to pick the people you choose to follow. Okay, Facebook uh, is, is increasingly a disastrous medium, and, and Zuckerberg seems to have lost control of his own pet project, which is uh, an amazing, it's an amazing thing. I mean, there's a reason that the stock is dropping. Okay, so yesterday I had the opportunity to sit down with Paul Ryan. And some of the folks who helped us make this happen were the folks, my friends over at Young America's Foundation, which is the exclusive home of my college tour. So we were in D.C. this past week. And even though the city shut down for the snow day, YAF helped us make sure that we were able to sit down with Speaker Ryan for a few minutes to talk about some of the issues Republicans are working on, as well as the future of the conservative movement. And uh, here is what it sounds like. Well, we are here with Speaker of the House Paul Ryan, which is pretty awesome. And we are here in the in the ceremonial room outside the Speaker's office, where apparently they sign bills and have heads of state, which uh, I, I'm sure you're honored to be here with me. I, uh, but <laughs> I am. Good to have you. Good to have you, Ben. Welcome. Uh, uh, thank you so much. I appreciate it. So, um, you know, there, there's a lot to talk about. Obviously, the elections are coming up. And uh, first, let me get your thoughts on, on where you think things are going to head. Um, you know, it's, it's a long ways away. I feel good about our chances. Uh, midterm elections are hard on the majority party. Midterm elections for a president's first midterm, on average, you lose like 32 seats. We've got a 24 seat majority. So just clearly with the headwind of history in front of us, that's not a good thing. But I feel like we're going to have a tailwind of accomplishments to get us into the midterms. Uh, we can get into the, all the agenda, but we've done so many things in such a short period of time that will actually made a positive difference in people's lives. And I think we're gonna have a really good story to tell, not to mention the fact that our candidates, our members are battle hardened. They know how to run tough, tough races. So I feel very, very good about where we are. So I wanna start by talking about some of those accomplishments and then I wanna to get to sort of the, the tactics that, that you guys are gonna use in, in, the, uh, in the election campaign. Yeah. So obviously you know, the, the top of the list for accomplishments is the tax bill right. and Democrats losing their minds That's over right. the tax bill did not look particularly good. So it, it's fair to point to Nancy Pelosi saying that you've given the American people crumbs that's and right. say that that's, that's wrong. So how much do you think that'll impact you? That's gonna be the gift that keeps giving, just, <laughs> just, that, just that statement. But every single Democrat voted against this. Uh, I really think they did that because they thought they were gonna psych us into defeating ourselves, particularly in the Senate. And when they kept pushing this line, they went so far left, so hard progressive, that every single Democrat voted against it. They're on the wrong side of history, and they're, they're on the wrong side of results. Mm -hmm. I've been working on this issue a long time. And basically, we have, this is bigger than 1986 tax reform. So this is the first time in 31 years we've done tax reform, but it's much more profound than the tax reform we did back then in 1986. Because this completely changes the way we tax ourselves on an international competitive basis. And this will put such a strong foundation of growth and opportunity and free enterprise in America, more so than any kind of economic reform in, in my lifetime. I'm, I'm convinced of that. And so they're on the wrong side of history. Uh, this takes a tax system that was the worst in the industrialized world and gives us a tax system that we think is in the top three of the industrialized world's tax systems. That means more jobs in America, more opportunity in America, businesses coming back to America, bringing capital back to America, expanding, and that is a phenomenally good thing. It's gonna give more careers, better wages, better benefits, more entrepreneurship, 
and the Democrats are against all of that. Well, one of the things that's, that's really difficult in the job that you have, Mr. Speaker, is obviously that uh, you are forced to do, po I mean, your job is to do policy. Yeah. But at the same time, it seems to me that elections are very little about policy these days, and they seem to be much more about uh, m different moral stances and maybe, we hope, battle of ideas. Right. Uh, how do you plan on tackling that? Yeah. Because you know we can talk about our policies being great right. all day long. Right. If, right. if good policy won, Republicans would never lose. Um, but, the, but the problem is obviously that, it, particularly if you look at the polls among young people, they're really, really egregiously bad. I mean, 70% yeah. of my audience is under the age of 35, uh, and the polls, even among conservative youngsters about Republicans, are not good. How are you going to win yeah. the battle of ideas when, when you're so focused on talking policy? And is I there know, a way to I shift know, away That's always that. been my issue. Uh, I've always strongly believed that elections need to be about choices and about ideas. And that's why in 2016, I got our House Republicans together to come up with an agenda and to run on it. We called it the better way so that we would have a game plan. We would give the country a very clear choice and that if we won the election, we would have earned the right to put that agenda in place. We're two thirds of the way from doing through doing that right now. And that gives us a, a good story to tell, which is here's what we said we would do. Here's what we did. This is what we did in Wisconsin, by the way, in 2010. Uh, the state legislature, our governor. It's a model that I, I believe in, that I saw work there. It's something we're trying to apply here nationally. And then we also have to go with new ideas in the election um, to, to continue this, this reform agenda, to disrupt it. Now, the point you made, I think, is important, but what about young people? The, the thing that bothers me the most, and I know you've, you've talked about this a bit, is identity politics. I hate identity politics. It's wrong. It's morally wrong, but also it's insidious, and it's, and it's practiced on both sides. Our job is to reject identity politics and try and replace it with better ideas and idea and aspirational politics. I'm a Jack Kemp acolyte. I'm a big believer in using our core founding principles, applying to the problems and show that there's solutions for everybody. And that to me is the kind of an agenda and temperament we have to have going into the 2018 elections. And, and so I wanted to ask you about that specifically, not in terms of you know efficiencies and economics, but about the moral differences that you see between yeah. right and left. Because I think these that's, right. that, that's the root issue, particularly for young people. Because yeah. you know you and I are both uh, big fans. Obviously, you long before before I was, and, and uh, in a much more prominent way, but you're big on entitlement reform. Yeah, entitlement right, reform right. is uh, obviously a difficult thing to sell to a bunch of 17-year-olds who never think they will be 60, right? Never, yeah. you, there's not right. a 17-year-old in America who, who cares about their social security because they're never going to be, be of age to receive That's it. Right. Uh, and so you know, this, when, when I speak to young people, which I do on a regular basis, uh, it seems to me that what they really want to hear is about this moral differentiation. So in your view, moving below sort of the, the top of the iceberg in politics, moving below the water level, what do you think is the big distinction between right and left in American politics? that needs to be elucidated. Yeah, we believe in equality of opportunity. They believe in equality of outcome. Equality of opportunity means we want to make sure that we use these guiding principles that built this country, liberty, freedom, free enterprise, self-determination, government by consent, which gives you an open economy, which gives you freedom, which gives you the ability to, to chart your life the way you want to. And we strive to promote equality of opportunity so that the most people can get the most opportunities possible. And nowhere else is that ever made more clear than a free enterprise system and than a freedom democratic capitalism like we have, like our system is a, a built on natural rights. What, what the left believes in, and look, you're asking a conservative what the left believes in, but they believe in equality of outcome. The difference in the kind and size and role of government you have between what we're saying and what they're saying is enormous. Having an equality of outcome agenda means Elites in Washington, unelected bureaucrats, micromanage our lives and, our, and everything we do in such a way that they believe they have to decide how our, how, what the results of our lives are. That's very different. That's the sense of equality, which is they make things equal in the end and the outcome of things. That gives you a stagnant society. That gives you a top-down society. That gives you, this is, I, mean, I come from Wisconsin, which is the birthplace of the, of the Progressive Party. They believe in all this early 20th century progressivism and Hegel and Bismarck and all these guys who basically think that we're all rubes and dubes and we don't know enough, so we need to delegate our power to these, these, uh, these smart bureaucrats that are insulated from elections so they can harmonize and micromanage our lives. And that is an equality of outcome philosophy. It's antithetical to our founding philosophy. And that, at the end of the day, is the big difference here. And so the fights we have up here, in many cases, not everyone, but in many cases, are fights of that origin. Mm -hmm. And I think that, uh, you know, I've, I've 
been watching, obviously, your political ascent for my entire life because uh, yeah, you're you younger. Younger um, but, <laughs> but certainly over the last uh, you know 15 years. And one of the things that uh, I wish that you had the opportunity to speak more about that stuff know, because it seems uh, like you're sucked more into speaking about the efficiency. Yeah, I'm outcomes. in the day job. Yeah, right. Exactly, right. Yeah, no, exactly. Because we do need thought leaders in the in the conservative movement who are talking specifically about the roots of the left and yeah. talking specifically about the the way that natural rights have been overcome by a different regime of how rights are thought about, right? The difference between yeah. positive and negative rights. Yeah, right. So when I go to, I, I talk to schools all the time, young people, I always say, look, these are our rights given to us pre-government. You don't even have to believe in God to believe that mm -hmm. they come from God. They're pre-government. So government can't take those away from us. That's us. That's We're sovereign. I don't even like the idea of negative versus positive. That's more of a mm -hmm. left construct. But the idea of government granted rights means we give our power to the government. I always say the healthcare debate. Everybody says healthcare is a right. If you buy into that premise, then we're saying we're giving our power to our government to tell us how, when, where, and under what circumstances we get to exercise that right. We're giving the government way too much power than we should. That's what the left is saying when they say they want to grant us these new rights. The best thing that I've found when I talk to young crowds is, um, if we do not get entitlements under control, which we can with more choice and competition and free enterprise and choice, if we don't get these things under control, we are gonna bankrupt the next generation. Mm -hmm. We've run the federal government, I round the numbers, we've run the federal government um, for the last 60 years by taking about 20 cents out of every dollar made in America, produced in America to pay for the federal government. If we do nothing, add no new programs, do nothing, by the time my kids are having kids, we're gonna to have to take 40 cents out of every single dollar made in America to pay for this government at that time mm -hmm. before they even get on to doing something else they wanna do with their government. So we will bankrupt the next generation. I actually had the CBO run numbers years ago on what tax rates would have to be. It goes up as high as 88% mm -hmm. for tax rates just to pay for this government at that time. So I try to explain to people in dollars and cents just what's going to happen to them if the left gets their way, they produce this equality of outcome agenda, we don't reform entitlements, and we stick with these kind of command and control systems. So I try to find a way of, 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 of explaining in dollars and cents what their future will look like from an economic and tax standpoint and how liberty and opportunity will be will be crushed if we stay in this particular path. Okay, so I also, before, while I had the opportunity, wanted to ask you about sort of the legislative versus executive balance, because one of the things sure. that I've been critiquing for a long time in the country, and I was doing it under Bush, I was doing it under Obama, I'm doing it now under the Trump administration, uh, is the is the increasing power of the executive branch, seemingly at the expense of the legislative branch, the growing yeah. bureaucracy, yeah. Uh, and, the, and the feeling that uh, the legislative branch over the last century and a half, really, has abdicated its duty to by kicking it over to the yeah. bureaucracy. A good example of this being trade. You know, the president obviously yeah, yeah. Uh, is is pushing a particular agenda on trade. This was not in the purview of the executive branch originally. This is in the purview of the legislative branch. You know, the Speaker of the House. What do you? How do you hope to? If yeah. you do, hope to reestablish the balance originally drawn. We we did some of we established. I wrote the Trade Promotion Authority Law, which mm -hmm. was to allow us to go get trade agreements, and we brought some of that power back into the legislative branch, but not nearly as much as we'd like. So I can go into the particulars of that, but there's a couple of things that we're trying to do here. Um, that we've passed out of the House. The biggest complaint you'll hear from a House Republican is the Senate filibuster and getting things through the Senate. Um, we have this thing called the Reins Act, which we think is sort of the catch-all of reclaiming Article One, which is 32 state legislatures do this. You pass a big law, it's vague, and, and then the bureaucracy fills in the details with its rules and regulations. Yep. And that just then happens. And so you end up having all these unelected bu bureaucracies effectively writing the laws we experience. We think that's wrong. So what we're saying with this RAINS Act, which is you pass a law, the rules and regulations get published, and then those rules and regulations come back to Congress for final vote, approval, or amendment before they go into effect so that they're um, consented to by the elected branch of government, the people who are mm -hmm. elected to write mm -hmm. the laws before they go into effect. And that holds us accountable, too. So to that end, what we do is we try to, in the bills we pass, since we can't get that through the Senate yet. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. We try to do it on an individual basis, on a bill-by-bill -bill basis. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And then um, I did something else. We have these lawyers called the Legislative Council. It's the Office of Legislative Council. Mm -hmm. They're actual bill drafters. I used to chair the Ways and Means Committee, which is mostly tax laws and healthcare laws. Tax laws have to be written really tightly, very, very prescriptively. And so I was worried we were writing too vague of a law. Mm -hmm. uh, we were just writing really vague laws right. and giving all this discretion to the bureaucracy. 
Except in tax laws. So what I did was I promoted the guy who was head of the tax law writing department mm -hmm. um, to run the entire legislative council department to train the other lawyers at the Legislative Council, how do you write laws really prescriptively right. so that we can reduce the kind of open-ended discretion we end up getting in the executive branch. So I'm trying to change sort of the culture of the way we legislate here so that we're far more detailed and prescriptive to, to not give all this discretion to the executive branch. I really appreciate you taking the yeah. time. And again, you have one of the hardest jobs in all of America. <laughs> That's what they tell I, me. Do not, I do not envy you, um, but uh, but I appreciate that you're trying to make philosophical arguments in a time when it seems that a lot of people are caught it's up actually, in It's actually the best politics. part of my day, so thank well, you. I appreciate yeah. it. Thank you. Yeah, you bet. Okay, so that was our uh, sit-down with Speaker of the House Paul Ryan. We expect to do a longer sit-down with him sometime in the near future, and then I can ask him about things like today's budget bill, which is garbage, <laughs> and uh, we can talk a little bit more about what he intends to do to stop uh, the overreach of the Senate, which seems to uh, only want to pass these omnibus packages that are that should not really be passed. Okay, so I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, other scandals brewing. Apparently, Stormy Daniels is going to be on 60 Minutes. The weather is getting stormy, and so we'll talk about all of that. But first, you're going to have to go over to Daily Wire and subscribe. For $9.99 a month, you can get a subscription to dailywire.com. When you do, you get the rest of my show live, the rest of Andrew Clavin's show live, the rest of Michael Moles' show live. You get to watch all of it on your screen. It's amazing. And you also get to be part of the mailbag, which we'll be doing tomorrow. Okay, it's, it's Thursday. I've completely lost track of time because this week has been such a whirlwind. But we will be doing the mailbag tomorrow. If you want to get your questions in and have them read on air and answered on air, subscribe right now. Also, if you want the annual subscription, you get this, the very greatest in all beverage vessels, the leftist tier is hot or cold tumbler. Ooh, behold its majesty. And you get all of that when you pay $99 a year. Also, we do appreciate when you subscribe. I get a lot of letters from folks saying, how can you help? The answer is you can subscribe, right? If you subscribe, it helps us bring you the show. It helps us bring you the website. It helps us bring you uh, the other shows that we do uh, and all the rest. Check it out there. If you just want to listen later for free, go over to iTunes, SoundCloud, YouTube, Stitcher, or Google Play, all of those apps. Make sure that you subscribe on all of them and download it on all of them and leave us a comment on all of them. That's your, that's your task for today. We are the largest, fastest growing conservative podcast in the nation. <laughs> Alrighty, so a quick roundup of other news. So meanwhile, uh, 60 Minutes is, uh, is now ready to do its interview with Stormy Daniels. Uh, according to the Daily Mail, the head of CBS News said Tuesday that a 60 Minutes interview with Stormy Daniels, who is, of course, the porn star that Trump stuck, is on its way, but that more journalistic work needs to be done on the story. David Rhodes is the president over at CBS News. I've met him. He's actually a, a reasonable fellow, I think. He said at a conference in Israel on Tuesday that the first time uh, CBS had confirmed that it interviewed Daniels, who has alleged an extramarital affair with Trump before he became president, she passed a lie detector. Listen, of course he had an affair with her. Of course. Okay, like, okay, I'm so tired of people futzing around this issue. Oh, she's lying. You're right. She's lying as, as every other porn star. All the women are lying. They're all lying. It's just not credible. I'm sorry. Michael Avenatti is a lawyer for the actress whose real name is Stephanie Clifford. Last week, he tweeted a picture of himself, Clifford, and Anderson Cooper. No, no air date has yet been set for the interview, but they are preparing. Rhodes said he could not imagine what the basis would be for any legal action by Trump's team to prevent the interview from airing. This is one of the weird things about the Stormy Daniels story. Uh, Jonah Goldberg pointed this out. A lot of people saying, well, you know, Trump denied all this sorts of activity during the campaign. But he's not, you know, he's denying that he had an affair with Stormy Daniels, but then why would he be paying Stormy Daniels $130,000 in order to shut her up? Like, to talk about an affair they didn't have? Then he could sue her for libel. So what exactly would be the point of any of this? It doesn't make any sense at all. So all of this continues to uh, continues to roll out over over the Trump White House. Uh, none of it is obviously particularly good for President Trump. Meanwhile, President Trump continues to fulminate about Russia and Vladimir Putin. He is obviously very sensitive about comments made about Russia. A lot of people were very critical of the president, including me, and when he congratulated the Russian president on his dicta his dictatorial victory in in the new fake elections over in Russia. Uh, he'd been bashed by some people, including Ben Sass, the senator from Nebraska, who I think says uh, a lot of very intelligent things. Sass uh, said a couple of things on the floor of the Senate the other day. He said, number one, Trump obviously should not be praising Putin. And number two, that material should not be leaking from the White House, which obviously is true. Okay, There's no way that there should be material leaking from the White House that says that people were telling Trump not to, that it was written on a memo in front of him, do not congratulate Putin. There are only a certain number of people in that room. If Trump really wants to be sure, he can just fire everybody who's in the room when he made the phone call or everybody who'd seen that memo. In any case, here was Ben Sass saying what he said and then Trump responding. Vladimir Putin is not a friend. Vladimir Putin is a despot. The president of the United States was wrong to congratulate him and the White House press secretary was wrong to dump, to duck a simple question about whether or not Putin's reelection was free and fair. 
It was not. The American people know that, the Russian people know that, and the world knows that. And yesterday, when the White House refused to speak directly and clearly about this matter, we were weakened as a nation, and a tyrant was strengthened. Now, Sass went on to talk about how uh, none of this stuff should have been leaked from the White House anyway, which is, of course, true. Trump responded by ripping on everybody else uh, about his own comments about Putin. So here were some of his tweets on this topic. He said, I called President Putin of Russia to congratulate him on his election victory. In past, Obama called him also. Okay, that's true. This is true. He says, the fake news media is crazed because they wanted me to excoriate him. They are wrong. Getting along with Russia and others is a good thing, not a bad thing. Okay, so far, this is all somewhat fair. Right? They, they never would have called for Barack Obama to rip on Putin. In fact, they were fine with Barack Obama offering flexibility to Putin right before a presidential election and then handing over control of Syria in the midst of a genocide to Vladimir Putin. So he's not wrong to be critical of the media. But this is where he begins to go wrong. Then he tweets this. They can help solve problems with North Korea, Syria, Ukraine, ISIS, Iran, and even the coming arms race. Bush tried to get along but didn't have the smarts, quote unquote smarts, now, nothing says, says that you are a smart person who can use the word smarts like using scare quotes improperly. Obama and Clinton tried, but didn't have the energy or chemistry. Remember, reset, peace through strength. Okay, um, that's not what peace through strength means. Uh, they cannot help us solve problems with North Korea. They have dealings with North Korea. They cannot help us solve problems in Syria where they've been bolstering the Assad regime and its genocide. They certainly cannot help us solve problems in Ukraine, which they invaded. They are not going to help us with problems with Iran, considering that they are fans of Iran. And as far as the coming arms race, it's Vladimir Putin who is currently testing long-range missiles again and talking about how they're upgrading their entire missile system to avoid missile defense. And Trump ripping on Bush and saying that he didn't have the smarts is just yuck. It's, I'm sorry, it's just, it's classless. Um, and uh, I love that, it's, that he thinks, here's the thing about Trump. Trump thinks that everything comes down to personal relationship because in essence, President Trump is a salesman. So he thinks that his relationship with Putin is gonna go well because he's a good salesman. Okay, Trump is a good salesman, but that's not how international relations work. Good salesmanship does not mean that you are better on the international stage. Proper use of the, the iron fist and the velvet glove, power and threat of force and the use of those things, right? That is the essence of diplomacy. Trump is not good at those things. When he says peace through strength, Ronald Reagan's peace through strength was that there would be peace because they knew that if they crossed the line, we'd bash them in the head. That's what peace through strength meant. Trump is saying nice things about Putin for no reason, then calling it peace through strength. That's not what that is. And it's foolish of President Trump to say that. Okay, time for a thing I like and then a thing I hate. Uh, and then we'll be back here tomorrow with the mailbag. So things I like. Uh, so this is well, not for the kiddies. It's probably not for many of the adults. The, there's a show on Netflix called Altered Carbon. Uh, for it is, it is heavily nudified. Okay, it's like Game of Thrones style nudity. Uh, lots, of, lots of boobies on this particular show. Uh, and it's not particularly necessary. I, I guess you can make the argument that it's sort of artistically necessary because the whole point of the show is that there is a future in which human beings have a uh, have their personality embedded in essentially a computer chip. Uh, and that computer chip is in the base of their skull. And that computer chip can actually be removed and implanted in other bodies. So you actually don't die when your body dies. They just take that computer chip and they take all your memories and everything. They just stick it into another body and you're good to go. Um, and so this body substitution regime is sort of the point of the is sort of the point of the series. About five episodes in, it's sort of noirish. If you like Blade Runner twenty forty nine, it's Blade. It's it's, it's that sort of feel. Uh, it's this kind of dark futuristic vision uh, with neon colors. It looks a lot like that that movie. Here's a little bit of the preview. Your body is not who you are. You shed it like a snake sheds its skin. We transfer the human consciousness between bodies to live eternal life. How long have I been down? 250 years. You are the property of Bancroft Industries. You've been provided with this body, which came equipped with military-grade Neurochem and combat muscle memory. Mr. So it's an interesting series. It's a cool looking series. I've heard that it gets kind of twisty near the end of the first season, so I'm looking forward to that. Uh, again, it, it's, it's heavily pornified, but the whole point here is that it's actually not sexy. So the, the, the fact that there is so much nudity, actually, it's like Westworld. It actually makes it not particularly sexy, specifically because uh, it, the, the message of the film is, uh, the message of the, the series is that your body is not all you are. In fact, it's very little of who you are. Um, but it is something. It, it raises some interesting philosophical questions. So worth watching if you can stand uh, if you can stand the 
an NC-17 rated of it. Okay, time for a quick thing that I hate. Alrighty, so uh, there are two quick things that I hate. First of all, apparently there's a student in the UK who is now alleging that he was reprimanded by his school for watching a video on a public computer of me talking with Dave Rubin. Hey, here's what he said. I got reported by someone for watching disturbing, hateful content in university premises and received an email from faculty course officer who wanted to be summoned for a student meeting. And uh, apparently the student says that because they, uh, they were watching this video of Ruben and me, that they were, that they were uh, threatened with suspension from school. This is certainly crazy, um, but it is unfortunately not all that uncommon. Uh, the left likes to lump into the category of hate speech anyone that it doesn't like. This is why they're trying to say that Jordan Peterson is responsible for hate speech. It's Anna Harris, who's not even on the right, is responsible for hate speech. All of it is stupid. All of it is nonsense. And it's why hate speech legislation like they have in Britain is insanely dangerous, because you can just start banning viewpoints that you don't like. Okay, the other thing that I don't like is uh, Ellen Dershowitz had a debate with Jeffrey Tubin uh, over on, uh, I believe, CNN about the Mueller investigation. And Dershowitz has been making the Dersh, as we used to call him at Harvard Law School, uh, has been making the case that I think is a pretty solid case that the um, uh, that the investigation, the Mueller investigation, has exceeded its legal boundaries, and he's now digging in areas where he was not originally designed to go. Jeffrey Tubin, who's a former Dershowitz student, uh, he says that Dershowitz is now a shell of the Trump administration. They go at it on CNN. Here's what it looked like. How has this come about that in every situation over the past year you have been carrying water for Donald Trump? This is not who you used to be. And you are doing this over and over again in, in situations that are just obviously ripe with conflict of interest. And, well, and it's, it's just like, what's what, happened what, to you? What conflict of interest? I attacked President not Trump. Not you. I'm talking about not your, your uh, conflict no. of interest, these I conflicts of interest. I attacked President Trump for his uh, uh, banning of Muslims. I attacked President Trump for leaking material about uh, uh, to Russia. I have attacked President Trump for many, many things. I'm not carrying his water. I'm saying exactly the same thing I said for years. Okay, and Dershowitz is exactly correct here, of course. You know, you may disagree with Dershowitz's analysis, but it's getting tiresome to watch people who don't like Trump simply suggest that anyone who defends Trump at any juncture, even if we've been very critical of Trump at other junctures, that those people have now become shills for the Trump administration. This polarized political environment is really gross. Just because you defend Trump when he's worth defending does not mean that you like Trump overall or you think everything that he's doing is right. And, if you, and, and, and just because you say that Trump does something wrong doesn't mean that you hate Trump overall. You may still like Trump overall. You know, we should be able to say what we think is right and what we think is wrong. I think Dershowitz has done a pretty good job of that. All right, we will be back here tomorrow with the mailbag. I look forward to seeing you then. I'm Ben Shapiro. This is The Ben Shapiro Show. The Ben Shapiro Show is produced by Mathis Glover, executive producer Jeremy Boring, senior producer Jonathan Hay. Our technical producer is Austin Stevens, edited by Alex Zingaro. Audio is mixed by Mike Coromina. Hair and makeup is by Jesua Alvera. The Ben Shapiro Show is a Daily Wire Forward Publishing production. Copyright Forward Publishing 2018.